What's up guys, I'm here again, and today I want to talk about how fascism is fundamentally a left-wing ideology. I want to talk about how it's anti-conservative, it's anti-capitalist, I want to talk about its origins in Marxism and in um, general discontent over the current times. I won't be talking much about Hitler or National Socialism. I think there's a great video out there by a YouTuber called TIK History um, called Hitler's Socialism that is four, five hours long in fact and goes into great detail about how National Socialism is Socialism, how it's distinct from fascism in its own way. And I, I highly recommend that video. So I think we should start with some definitions. Uh, I'm going to offer two definitions of leftism. Um, I think I think they can both be um, applied to fascism. The first is how I like to define leftism, and that is that it's countercultural. It seeks to overthrow the status quo in some way and implement a new status quo. The second definition of leftism, and this is one that leftists tend to gravitate towards, um, I think it's a little too flattering, um, and that's leftism is about getting rid of hierarchies. And I think this is an okay definition as long as you add the caveat of unjust hierarchies, because, I mean, in my experience, leftists don't just uh, want to get rid of every single hierarchy ever. I mean, they, 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 they're, not, they're not particularly upset about parents having authority over their kids, for example. Um, so I, I think a lot of political discussion on the left is a look at which hierarchies are just and which ones are unjust. Next, defining fascism is a little more difficult. Um, there's a popular handout that's helpful in identifying fascism that covers like 11 things that are commonly associated with it. The chauvinism, racism, things like this. These are very general applicable things. Um, it's, it's not a perfect definition by any means. How I would like to define fascism today is as anarcho-nationalism. I do think fundamentally uh, the ideology of fascism is rooted in concepts of anarcho-nationalism, which might sound like a contradiction to you, but hopefully over the course of this video you'll see that it's, it's not, um, in, at least how fascists uh, view the world. Finally, uh, just quickly define conservative, conservatism as I define it is just uh, support for the status quo, a willingness to preserve the status quo. Um, it's not about going backwards, as uh, some conservatives and some liberals like to conject. It's, it's not anti-progressivism. I mean, that sounds really stupid. Obviously, any political ideology worth its salt should be progressing in, in some capacity and trying to make society better instead of worse. I mean, that just seems obvious. So um, now that we have our terms aligned, we can uh, get into the history of fascism. So the first historical figure we're going to dive into is a proto-fascist called George Sorrell. He's known for his ideology of Sorellianism, which was influential to both um, Lenin in his um, creation of Bolshevism but also in Italian fascism, um, in Giovanni Gentile and uh, Benito Mussolini. Um, George used to be a monarchist, but became a Marxist through uh, socialist readings, um, including Proud One. And essentially what him and his followers did was to get paid by status to go around and to beat up Marxist, leftist Marxist, right? 
um, he, he was certainly used as a pawn of uh, conservatives in a lot of ways. Uh, a weird little historical fact, but nonetheless, him and his followers were, ide <clears throat> were ideologically motivated by uh, their perception that left-wing Marxists were ineffective and that they needed more violence in their political approach to get anything done. So this growing faction of Sorelianism that uh, led to fascism was a sort of unholy union between anti-capitalist, monarchist, and authoritarian leftist. The next historical figure that I think is important to understand is a guy called Giovanni Gentile, um, an Italian philosopher um, heavily influenced by Marx, um, who ghost wrote part of uh, Benito Mussolini's Doctrine of Fascism. So he was quite influential in Italian fascism. I want to go over some quotes of his that reinforce what I was saying about George Sorrell's influence on fascism and of Marx's influence on fascism. <clears throat> Let's start here. Fascism as a consequence of its Marxism and Sorellian patrimony conjoined with the influence of contemporary Italian idealism through which fascist thought attained maturity conceives philosophy as praxis. Another quote. The fascist, on the other hand, conceives philosophy as a philosophy of practice. That concept was the product of certain Marxist and Sorellian inspirations, as well as the influence of contemporary Italian idealistic doctrines from which fascist mentality drew substance and achieved maturity. So Giovanni Gentile certainly thinks that, uh, and certainly recognized at the time, what was influencing fascism ideologically. Hegel, Marx, George Sorrell, and what Giovanni keeps emphasizing in these quotes is the importance of praxis, which is like practice. It's um, really just a concept of political action and um, it's really sort of a appeal to real politics. And there's another quote by Giovanni here that I think highlights the idea of anarcho-nationalism. So I want to read this. The authority of the state was not a product, but a presupposition. It could not depend on the people. In fact, the people depended on the state, the fascist state. On the other hand, is a popular state, and in that sense, a democratic state par excellence. Every citizen shares a relationship with the state that is so intimate that the state exists only insofar as it is made to exist by the citizens. Now, what he's saying here, and what he says quite a bit in his writings, is that the state is, to use a Marxist term, a product of historical necessity. Which... <clears throat> Which essentially means that he believes that the state is a just hierarchy. You know your constitutional history, you might start to notice uh, similarities which ha uh, between how a fascist thinks of the nation and how our founding fathers uh, justified the existence of a nation. Both view the state as being in a sort of contract with the people and they think that the state gets its justification from the people. Now, where fascists take it a step further is their um, analysis of the ways that they believe the nation is being undermined. And you begin to see the anti-capitalist influence, which um, of course leads right into an anti-Semitic influence as well you see a stark opposition to a liberal democracy, which is um, the kind of democracy that America has. It's distinguished from a socialist democracy or um, a pure democracy. It's a limited democracy. And 
fascist um, opposition to liberal democracy is par for the course for leftists. They believe that it is completely run by corporations, essentially, um, a sort of manufactured consent, uh, to reference Noam Chomsky. So they believe that liberal democracy as a force in the nation is undermining the will of the people and um, bringing powers more towards um, aristocrats and plutocrats, corporatists, things like that. So another way a fascist might argue that capitalism is undermining the nation is by appealing to um, really just kind of old, older economics like mercantilism, and these arguments still persist to today. Um, the uh, nationalization of important war resources, things like this. Um, generally, they just believe that capitalism diverts resources away from the nation's interests, uh, with the nation as a leviathan wants. And the final way that fascist contend capitalism is undermining the nation is by perverting um, people's moral values. I think you've probably uh, heard of from Nazi Germany because this certainly delves into anti-Semitic territories, but it's pretty um, par for the course for fascism. You also hear this, these kind of arguments in pale conservatism that um, libertarians sell away our culture in a way. The next figure that I think is important to understand in fascism is, of course, Julius Evola, who's the pseudo-intellectual's favorite pick for fascist thinkers. There used to be an essay of his online about the, the false dichotomy between capitalism and socialism that I thought was a great look into his ideology, but I do have here a quote of similar substance that we'll go over. Nothing is more evident than that modern capitalism is just as subversive as Marxism. The materialistic view of life on which both systems are based is identical. Both of their ideals are qualitatively identical, including the premises connected to a world, the center of which is constituted of technology, science, production, productivity, and consumption. And as long as we only talk about economic classes, profit, salaries, and production, and as long as we believe that real human progress is determined by a particular system of distribution of wealth and goods, and that, generally speaking, human progress is measured by the degree of wealth or indigence, then we are not even close to what is essential. So, in analyzing Julie Savola, we're able to identify other persistent features of fascism. Um, their opposition to in individualism is very clear here. Um, Julius Evola was perhaps the only person, uh, philosopher I've met, to identify as a collectivist. It's, it's quite rare. And he, I think, correctly identifies both socialist thinking and capitalist thinking as fundamentally individualistic. So additionally, with Julius Suvola, you start to see fascism's uh, opposition to Christianity, instead preferring uh, various forms of mysticism, paganism, and being weirdly drawn to um, Islamism, of all things. They uh, generally view Christianity as an individualistic religion, a sort of uh, pussified, cuckified religion. Um, and they view Judaism in much the same way. I should also note that by this time fascism had become its own uh, distinct political philosophy and uh, began opposing other Marxists and socialists, which certainly does not disqualify it from being a leftist. I mean, leftist infighting is just the default position, really. Um, so I, I don't think the fact that Julius Evola was critical of Marxism um, means much here.
the, the ideology of fascism, as I, I shown before, was very much rooted in uh, Hegelianism and uh, Marxist reinterpretations. The final figure I want to analyze is a modern, fantastic example of a fascist thinker in Alexander Dugan, or Dugan, often called the uh, brain of Putin. He's been influential in uh, Russian politics of the modern era. Um, I really just want to point out his stark oppositions to capitalism, to liberal democracy, and to socialism as well. And to show that opposition to all three of those things is compatible in a modern ideology, and we see it today. So now that we've gone over some figures and some history, I want to get into my primary argument here that uh, fascists are anti-conservative. And what I mean by that is that they fundamentally seek to overthrow the status quo. They, they are pushers of dissatisfaction in the uh, political sphere, um, pushers of political action. In, in the sphere. Unlike conservatives who uh, I believe should um, advocate political apathy, who mm -hmm. don't advocate for change and significant change in the political system because they think it's fundamentally fine, um, they certainly don't uh, come up with all these conceptualizations about a perfect nationalist world where um, every individualistic group that identifies as a race or nation can govern itself in some weirdly undemocratic way that's supposedly even more democratic than liberal democracy. And the argument is quite simple. Um, just if you look at the history of when fascism has risen, it's always been when leftism was popular. It's always been when dissatisfaction with the status quo was at an all-time high. Uh, for example, after the Great Depression, that's when we saw the first wave of fascism and National Socialism. And nowadays we see um, a sort of rise in fascism in um, a significant rise in paleoconservatism a significant rise in the alt-right, which has some uh, fascist leanings. And this is also in an era when dissatisfaction with the status quo is at an all-time high, where leftism has dominated the zeitgeist. It's in the aftermath of the Iraq War and of the 2007 uh, housing collapse. Both of those things uh, have done massive blows to uh, to people's perception of the uh, government's ability to do much of anything. So people have become increasingly dissatisfied, and with that, you see a a, a rise of fascism, as is to be predicted. <laughs> and these fascists today trend just as much towards anti-capitalism as they do to anti-socialism. You um, see it now, just like you saw it back then. Even Tr Donald Trump was a registered Democrat until he switched over to being a Republican. Um, the entire alt-right movement originated from the Atheist Plus movement, largely. Dissatisfied leftists who were really upset with the left's uh, PC approach to Islam and race. So I hope you're beginning to understand how these culturally conservative movements can be so anti-conservative in disposition. Um, they originate entirely from left-wing circles and they carry on in being dissatisfied with the status quo and seeking to implement something new. So that's it guys. That's my argument for why I think fascism is a left-wing ideology.
It's anti-conservative. It's anti-capitalist. Its origins are in left-wing thought. Its founders were left-wing. What more can be said? So if you liked the video, if you found it interesting or informative, leave a like or comment. I appreciate it. Peace.